see how that works. Um, if you're taking your Bibles, you're with me, hopefully, Acts chapter 27. We are in Paul's encounters, and we're in encounter number four. The first encounter was that of the procrastinating politician, Felix. He decided he didn't want to deal with this. Two years, Paul sat in jail. The second guy was this pushy politician. Festus comes on the scene, and he says, I'm going to solve this. He gets involved in it. He's like, oh, my goodness, I've messed up. Paul's innocent, but I got to send him to Caesar. Big mistake, and, and that encounter didn't go well. And so Festus calls on King Agrippa. And so Paul's encounter number three, he goes through everything with Agrippa. And Agrippa gets to the end of this. He says, man, if he wouldn't have appealed to Caesar, he'd probably be innocent. He'd probably be set free, but he appealed to Caesar. And all three of those guys, as best we can tell by Scripture, rejected the message of the gospel. All three encounters, all three of them, as best we can tell, end up in heaven. You say, well, man, if Paul's presenting the gospel and people won't listen to Paul, how are they going to listen to me? Well, the truth of the matter is, it really was that they rejected Paul because they all found Paul innocent. They did. They were just appeasing somebody else. They found him innocent. Uh, the message Paul put out there was great. The gospel was put out there. And here's what they did. They said, Paul, you're innocent. But we're going to reject, not you. We're going to reject God. You know what, guys? I, it's a whole different picture if you reject me. I, I don't want you to, but you know what? I can handle it. I'll, I'll still sleep tonight. I may toss and turn. But, still, but when you reject God, wow, things change. And all three of these men rejected not only Paul, they rejected God, as best we can tell, ended up in hell. So now we come to encounter number four. It's not necessarily a person, but it's in a series of events that all wrap around this storm and this shipwreck that's going to happen in the life of Paul. So if you're able and willing, would you stand with me and read of God's Word? Acts chapter 27. Uh, we are going to begin reading in verse number 10, and we're going to read certain verses in this dialogue, this narrative to try to tie it all together with today's message. Acts 27, verse number 10. And said unto them, Paul speaking, Sirs, I perceive that this voyage will be with hurt and much damage, not only of the landing and the ship, but also of our lives. Paul says, I don't think we should do this. Nevertheless, the centurion, he believed the master and the owner of the ship, more than those things which were spoken by Paul. Verse 13. When the south wind blew softly, supposing they had obtained their purpose, loosing thence, they sailed close by Crete, but not long after there arose against a tempestuous wind called Euro Clidon. Big, huge, massive storm. Look with me in verse 21. I'll tie the dialogue together here in a moment. But after long abstinence, Paul, he stood forth in the midst of them. He said, Sirs, you should have hearkened unto me and not have loosed from Crete to have gained this harm and loss. You should have listened to me. And now I exhort you, be of good cheer. For there shall be no loss of any man's life among you, but of the ship. For there stood by me this night the angel of God, whose I am, whom I serve, saying, Fear not, Paul, thou must be brought unto Caesar. And lo, God hath given thee all of them that sail with thee. Wherefore, sirs, be of good cheer. For I believe God that it shall be even as it was told me. God bless the reading of his word. You may be seated this morning. I don't know if you're like me, but um, once, once my parents got a TV, it seemed like the TV was on in the house all the time. And, and from sun up to sun down or past, the TV's always on. So I just I need a confessional. Does anybody just always have the TV on, or is it just me? Okay, okay, we, we have 
We have some people that admit it. We have some wives punching their husbands and saying, yeah, it's on all the time. Um, here, here's, here's the deal. I try to keep on wholesome TV because of the kids, especially when they're younger, and I, I'm not trying to look at bad movies or anything like that. And so some of the times I'll flip through channels and, and we'll watch some reality TV type stuff or we'll watch some different shows. And, and one of the shows I've come upon that I really do enjoy, it's called Wicked Tuna. Now, how many of y'all have watched Wicked Tuna? I'm just before I go into this, okay. So here's the deal, there's eight or 10 vessels that are going out tuna fishing. And they have the cameramen on the boats and they're trying to catch these big tunas and sometimes they weigh 200 pounds, sometimes they weigh 500 pounds. If you get 500 pound tuna, and, and you're gonna get a lot of money paid for it. And so it's, a, it's interesting, it's just, I like, for one, they're fishing, two, they're on the sea, and, those, and they catch some fish to use as bait, and then they throw them out there and they get these big old fish hooked in. And so it's watching them just get the tune on. But here's, here's with that. One, I get seasick, so I can't go out and do it. Although I think I love it. I mean, I, but I get seasick. I took my, my, one of my daughters on a half day um, deep sea fishing thing. Um, she fished. I was in the bathroom for about half hour. And then I sat like in the middle of the boat, my head down for the next three hours because I was sick as could be. Um, yeah, she fished. She actually caught the largest fish of the day on that half day charter. I would love to do it, but I can't. I just can't. So I, I live through these guys. And here's what happens. These, these guys sort of risk their lives when storms come up. They're out there fishing and it's raining on them and the waves are just everywhere. And I'm like, Man, they must be paying you really, really, really good money to do this for TV. Especially the cameramen. I mean, they don't even get to fish. They're out there watching others fish. And the storms come up and they, they just keep fishing through it. And, and like nothing's going on because, well, they enjoy the reality TV. The storms that come on the sea, I'm, I'm okay to watch. I can sit in my in a recliner and watch the TV and I watch them go through the storm. And I watch them endure the storm and to this point they all get home okay from the storm. And it's and I get to watch them go through it. It doesn't bother me one bit. And sometimes it's entertaining to me. But when it comes to real life, when the storm hits you or me, things change changed dramatically. Uh, we've gone through family storms. We've all had family issues that, that have caused problems. Uh, we all have in-laws and outlaws in our family, uh, you know, people in our family that cause issues. And, and through all that, we've gone through storms in life. Families have done it. You've gone through storms in your employment. Some of you may have lost jobs, but some of you may say this job, uh, you know, I'm done with it. They can have it. I'm going to go do something else. Um, I thought it was going to be greener grass, and it wasn't, so now I'm going to do my own thing. We've all gone through those type of storms, and when we come to this encounter, we can, we can learn from this how Paul deals with this storm. Let me acknowledge a couple things first. Number one, Paul ended up going through a storm that he knew could have been prevented. All right, that's number one. Number two, Paul almost ends up dying having to do something that could have been prevented. Number three, we get through this, the entire ship and everything on the ship totally destroyed, could have been prevented. And in all that, Paul ends up shipwrecked that could have been prevented, and he knew it. Now, I'll call it collateral damage. You ever been hurt because of somebody else's stupidity? I mean, can I say that in church? Someone else's ignorance. You ever been hurt because of that? We all would say, yeah, we have. Somebody else makes a huge mistake and affects me. Someone else makes a decision that is wrong and it affects me. Someone else wouldn't listen to my advice and it affects me. And Paul ends up having to go through this entire storm in his life to be shipwrecked 
And, and honestly, if you study out his life and his writing, 2 Corinthians, he says he was shipwrecked three times. It wasn't the first time he's shipwrecked. And he's been through this before. And so let me, let me say this. You may end up going through a storm someone else is causing. You may be the one causing the storm for someone else to go through. But we all go through these storms. So what do we do with that? Notice with me the first thing of Paul. Um, when you see a storm and you want to stay out of it, there's this precaution. There's this warning he puts out there. And we read the scripture. He says, guys, I'm just going to tell you. He looks at the centurion, the guy who's dealing with him. They've got a couple hundred men that they are trying to transport. And he's like, listen, dude, I'm just telling you, we don't need to go. Weather's not going to be good. I promise you, we don't need to go. Last thing we need to do is get on this boat. And so this Roman centurion, who is a military man, if this was a military mission, he would have said, no, I got it under control. If this was transporting prisoners on land, I got it under control. If this was an ambush that he was setting up, centurion would be like, I got it under control. But this is something the centurion's not sure about. He, he's not a sailor. He's not a guy that's been out there on the Mediterranean Sea all his life. He's not the captain of a ship. And so here's what we got. We got the captain saying, oh, we're good to go. And the centurion's got to make a decision. And Paul says, don't do it. Don't do it. He says, here's your warning. I perceive there will be great loss if you do this. So Paul now encounters a centurion who does not accept his message. Paul is rejected again. I mean, how many times do you have to be rejected when you're trying to warn somebody? I think of, I think of the whole parenting setting. I am now, according to my wife, parenting two adult children. And, and so now it's like, you know, do I tell them what to do? Do I warn them? Hey, guys, you really need to do this. And then, I know y'all never dealt with this, but your children don't do what you told them to do. Has anybody ever had your child, adult children, not do what you tell them to do? Y'all, nobody wants to raise your hand. Yeah, a few people. Yeah. Oh, wow. Jerry, thank you for that. I appreciate that. Um, you know, when you're adult children, it's like, I, come on. I mean, I, I know I'm not 50. I'm almost 50. I know, but really, you... And so I tell my wife, I hate being right, but I don't. But I do, but I don't. Um, and when I'm wrong in those settings, it's like, man, I can, I can honestly, I'm glad I was wrong. I'm really glad, but I was right. Um, here's, here's Paul. He gives the warning, and they ignore him once again. You see a storm, and they head right into this storm. What do you do? What do you do? Well, they get in the storm and they encounter the problems. I mean, that's, that's what you're going to do. When you get in the storm, you've got these problems now upon you. And here's, here's the ship. And the storyline is this. They, they're trying to travel close to the coastline to get all the way to Rome, to Italy. And, and so you're down there on the Mediterranean Sea and you're going from port to port to port. And you're just trying to stay close to the coastline. You don't want to get out there in the middle of the ocean. You're just trying to get from port to port in the storms, and hopefully you can do that to get, get around over to Italy. That's, that's the whole goal of this adventure. And so sure enough, they deal with the problems. The storm is not only coming, the storm is here, and the problems are in front of you. What do you do when you see the problems? We well, try to solve them, I hope. Um, we all want to solve the problems. Men are fixers. I, I've, I've said this. Um, and I love trying to fix things. I, I really do. If there's a problem, I want to try to fix it. I, I, want, to, I want to get it fixed. Um, I created a problem yesterday. I put posts in the ground out on our mission day. Three posts I put in grass area. Three posts I put in rock. And I used a post driver. My daughter, well, my daughters helped me. And I post drive. I drove those green five-foot stakes in the ground and I put them in rock so at the end of our mission we need to get the stakes down and for some reason I guess I have more strength than I think I put the stakes in the ground too far and I couldn't get them out I couldn't get them out 
So I looked at one guy, I said, you got a hammer? And he goes over the truck and pulls out one of these five pound sledgehammers. We start banging on it, banging on it, banging on it. He's like, hold on. He goes, get the crowbar. Get the crowbar over. So now we're trying to use a crowbar and a hammer to get these green stakes out of the ground that I put in the ground. So here's, here's the image I want you to get. I want you to see there are three men attempting to fix what I messed up. I mean, that's the bottom line. And then we had one blessed lady come over and, and make a comment about all these men just standing around trying to get something done. And she was right, because by that time, two of us were just standing watching the other two try to fix what the preacher created, the problem he, he put in place. Uh, here, here's what I say. Most of us create our own problems. We create our own problems. We know better. We, we know better than walk in the storm. We, we know better than to even go that direction. We create our own problems in this whole setting. And so now in the storm, we need to fix it. We need to fix it. And this is where, I don't want you to miss this, some brilliant theologians, pastors have, have spent hours of study and, and in this. When you're in the storm, there's a process. Paul, according to scripture, had basically been absent. He had kept his mouth shut. He hadn't said anything. And it's where we, where we jumped in our reading in verse 21. He had kept his mouth shut. He had sat back. He had watched them in this storm for days. And he had yet to come out and say, I told you so. He's getting ready to. But he hadn't done it yet. Because when you're in the storm, you're sort of just trying to figure out, what am I going to do next? What am I going to do next? The captain of the boat, well, he's trying to do everything he can to keep his boat going. The centurion, he's trying to keep all of his, all of his men under him, all the criminals under him, uh, in the criminal hold and keeping them where they need to be. Um, the, the people on the ship, the deck, the, the workers, they're all trying to navigate this storm. And Paul finally makes his scene known in the storm. And let me, let me give you this line, and we're going to get to his statements. When people are in a storm, one, they really do want help. They really do want help. Now, that help may cost you. They may not like you. They may hate you. In the storm, someone walks in and says, hey, okay, let me, let me help you fix this. And you're like, I don't need you. I don't want you. They may be mad at you for coming in and saying, well, this is how you fix your, your marriage. I don't want you to help me fix my marriage. I'll figure it out. And there may be some, some problems, but here's what Paul does. He walks up after being absent, verse 21, and he says, guys, I told you so. Here's the process I'm going to put before you. First of all, I'm going to condemn you for not listening to me. I'm going to condemn you. I warned you, I told you so, and I'm going to condemn you for not listening to what I said. You say, that's me. Okay. Okay. It's the truth. It's the truth. Because maybe next time they'll listen to me. Because they're going to need to. You should have listened to me. You should have, watch this, pastor to his church. You should have obeyed God's word. If you would have obeyed God's word to begin with, we wouldn't be in this storm. I went through the first chapter of Jonah in the youth Sunday school this morning. The man put himself in that mess. All he had to do was obey God. That's all he had to do. And many times we create our own storms. Paul says, you messed up. You messed up. So he condemns them, first of all. Notice with me what he does after he condemns them. He comforts them. And it's pretty funny. Verse 21, you should have listened to me. Verse 22, I exhort you, be of good cheer. <laughs> Paul, you're an idiot. We're in the midst of a storm. This Euroclidon, it's this whole northeaster. This thing's almost like a, a tornado, a hurricane, whatever you want to put them both together. It's massive. Don't tell me to be of good cheer. We've thrown over things overboard. We've lightened the ship. We've done everything we could. And you want me to be of good cheer? It's the same Greek word that Jesus tells a blind guy when Jesus shows up to him and says, Hey, be of good cheer. I'm going to heal you. 
You've got to be kidding me. You want me to be of good cheer. Here's what I've learned in the storms of life. It's really based on how you respond to them. If I as a parent warn my children and my children still make the mistake, then how do I respond to that storm of life? I told you. But tell you what, we're going to get through this. We're going to settle all this down. and We're going to, we're going to try to get you moving forward. And we're going to get past this storm of life. We're going, to, we're, going to, we're going to move on. And here's Paul. He says, you know what? I'm going to condemn you, but I'm going to comfort you. I want you to be of good cheer. Notice what he does next. He acknowledges the casualties. He said, just so you know, um, you're going to be okay, but the ship's going to be lost. Well, that's exciting. Uh, you know, so so how is this going to work out that we're going to be okay, but the ship is going to suffer loss? But we're going to, I mean, a couple hundred people on board the ship, we're going to be okay. Ship's going to be destroyed. That's exciting. Um, and so here, here's me, back of my mind. Paul, I appreciate you, you know, comforting me. We're going to be okay. But then you just told me the ship's going to be destroyed, but I'm still going to be okay. That's not comforting because I don't swim. I don't. I, I barely. I don't tread water. I, I sink like an axe head. I mean, I, you know, it's just, I, I'm going to sink. Um, and that's not good, Paul. And Paul's like, I oh, don't worry. You're going to be fine, too. You're, you're going to be fine. Everything's going to be good. You're, you're fine. Don't worry about this process that we're going to go through. Because when it's all said and done, you get through the storm. Get through it. The storm will not kill you. You know, I, I'd like you to put that into your own life. As we go through storms of life, the storms really is not what kills us. Sometimes we, we kill ourselves in depression and we kill ourselves not taking care of ourselves. And maybe it's health things. But, you know, the storm, we can get through. We can get through the storm. Whether we're the innocent guy like Paul, whether we're the guilty guys who wouldn't listen, Paul has to go through this storm. And he says, you know, be a good cheer. We're, we're good. Everything's going to be good. And, and so here's what they do. Uh, we didn't read verse 28, but let me, let me read verse 28. They sounded, and they, they found there were about 20 fathoms. And when they got a little further, they sounded again. Um, they found it would be about 15 fathoms. And they were getting closer and closer to, to the shore. Verse 29, fearing they should fall upon the rocks, they cast four anchors out of the ship, out of the stern, and they wished for day. They wished for day. Here's, here's what Charles Swindoll says concerning the four acres and these men. They cast them all on the same side. He said, first of all, anchor number one is that of stability. You put an anchor in the water, the ship's supposed to be stable. They want to keep it right there. They cast four of these things. He says, anchor number two is that of unity. Let's everybody get on the same page. Let's everybody throw it on the same side. Let's all of us put our ship, put it, get it grounded, gather together right here. Um, he says, anchor number three is that of renewal. If we get anchored right here, all of us can stop for a moment and gather together. We can renew each other. We can strengthen each other. And, and we didn't read it, but here's what, here's what Paul does. When they cast these anchors, they get to the fourth one. Um, it's, it's the anchor of reality, according to Charles Swindoll. He puts these anchors in the ground. They get them settled. And Paul says, okay, guys, it's time for you to eat. They haven't eaten in over 10 days. Were trying to spare whatever food they could. Paul says, you know what? It's time. You messed up, but we're going to live through this. Everybody needs to eat. So this time the centurion listens. The captain of the ship says, okay, yeah, let's eat. And they feed everybody on the ship. Paul passes out the food. They get it passed out, and he says, okay, let me pray. <laughs> They're like, we've been praying. <laughs> we've been praying a long time. He prays over the food. And every person on the ship renews himself, sustains himself, gets food in their bodies, strength for the end of the storm. 
you know, the end of the storm is usually the worst part of it. You're, you're waiting for it to sort of finish up. You've endured it, and you're like, will this thing just, will this thing just go? Um, it's, it's a person that's been caught in a criminal deed, and they, they finally are facing their judgment in the courtroom. It's a family that's gone through turmoil, and they finally come together, and they're trying to put an end to what they've gone through. And, and they come to this, and he says, you know what? These anchors not only ground everybody together, it brings them together in unity. They take a moment to strengthen themselves together, and then the reality hits. We just put all four anchors on the stern side of the ship, which means we just anchor our ship all on one side. And by doing that, when this storm comes in to blow us, this ship is anchored. You know what happens to a ship that is anchored firmly in the ground and the wind comes into it? It rips it apart. It rips it apart. When they put these anchors in the ground, they knew the ship was a loss. They made the decision right there. The ship's gone. Now we got to live. We got to get through this. We got to hope for daylight. I mean, that's, that's what it was. We got to hope for daylight. Let's just get to the next day. Let's just see daylight. And the process going through the storm is the toughest. We know it. We've gone through it. We do need to get grounded. We do need to be with each other in stable environments. We need to be unified when we go through a storm. We need to renew each other when we go through a storm. And there needs to be a reality that when we're getting ready to get out of that storm, we push forward. We go forward as hard as we can. We get through the storm. The process is there. So here's Paul. Okay, guys, I told you he's going to live. Um, so he looks at the centurion and says, listen, here's the best thing you can do. Everybody can swim, jump off the ship. Swim to shore. Anybody can't swim, this ship's going to get broken up. Give them a piece of wood, let them float to shore. And here's the military side of this. I can't let these prisoners escape. Can't do it. And the discussion is to kill every prisoner. Every prisoner was killed all. And the centurion, who neglected to listen to Paul the first time, has now trusted Paul as a leader on the ship, prayed over their meal, anchored the ship, and has told everybody, be of good cheer. <laughs> You're not going to die out here. And Sir Terrian says, you know what? I'm going to listen to Paul this time. I'm going to listen to him. I'm going to do it. And as this ship goes to shore, it hits the rocks, breaks apart. The soldiers have been released and everybody does the best they can to make it to shore. And everybody at that moment is fleeing for their lives. The bottom line is in that moment when you go through the storm, God's going to protect you. God's going to protect you in the storms of life. Uh, we quote a scripture many times out of context, but uh, we quote them saying, well, God's never going to put on me anything more than I can handle. Not true. If we put it in context, it's that God is not going to test you with something that you can't handle. Um, I've seen, sadly, I've seen many people die of cancer. They went through a storm they couldn't handle. They died. We say, well, if they were a Christian, they went to heaven. Well, if they weren't a Christian, they went to hell. Guess what? God put them through something they couldn't handle. He gave them an opportunity to handle it. They couldn't. They didn't accept him as Savior. And the truth of the matter is, this storm, God says, you know what? I said, I'm going to put Paul in Rome, and I'm going to protect Paul through this storm. Because I'm going to protect Paul through this storm, I'm going to show his leadership, and every person on this ship is going to be protected through this storm. Can you imagine for a moment going through a massive storm and God protects you through it. Now, you lost your belongings, you lost the ship, you lost any supplies that were on the ship, 
you went through a huge shipwreck and you get to shore and you realize God protected you through all that. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? All right, I mean, cut to the chase. When you get through the storm and you look back at the storm and realize I'm safe and God protected me through this and I went through this crazy process and yes, I went through a lot of problems in this storm. And yes, there was even a, a warning. I was precautioned about this. I didn't have to go through all this. And, and all of this brought me to God's protection. When I get done, as God protects me through this storm, here's what I'm going to do when the storm's over. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to praise the Lord. I'm going to tell some people, hey, I got through a massive storm. You wouldn't believe the storm I just got through. You wouldn't believe God's grace on my life. Even if I told you everything God's brought me through, you wouldn't believe it. The protection leads us to God's praise. God's praise. What do you do when the storm is over? Here's, here's usually what we do when the storm's over. We kick back and say, man, I'm glad I got through that. You heard what I said. Glad I got through that. Glad my family got through that. Glad I survived that storm. And we miss praising God to forgive us through the storm. We miss it. And so here's, here's where I want to draw us all together. Finish up this sermon today. A group by the name of Casting Crowns, when they first started out as a trio, now they're a group of about six, seven different people. They wrote a song in 2005 stated, I will praise you in the storm. The chorus goes something like this. I'll praise you in this storm. I will lift my hands for you are who you are, no matter where I am. Every tear I've cried, you hold in your hand. By the way, that's in Proverbs. You never left my side and thought my heart is torn. And though my heart is torn, I will praise you in this storm. So here's Paul. Whatever storm you're in, be of good cheer. Be of good cheer. Here's, here's what we want. And I'm just going to be honest with you guys. We want the storm of the disciples. That's the storm we like to talk about. The disciples are out on the Sea of Galilee. The storm comes up and they're, they're tossed about all night long. And Jesus comes walking along the, the, the Sea of Galilee. And they're like, hey, hey, can you help us here? And Peter's like, hey, can I come out and see you? And Jesus like, come on. And, and we like that storm. Can we tell you why? Because everybody's safe in the boat. We like that storm. That's a cool storm. What a big deal when Jesus come up and he, he saved us. This storm, Paul, man, this is different. Wouldn't it be nice if Jesus would have just calmed the waves? I mean, in the life of Jonah, when Jonah's thrown overboard, the mariners are on the boat, and what happens to the boat? As soon as they throw them overboard, the sea is calm. Oh, that would be nice. Let me just have everything calm. But that's not the way it is with Paul. You see, and, and here's, here's what I want you to get. When you go through the storms of life, there's going to be damage. There's going to be damage. And you've got to deal with the damage. And to deal with the damage, let me just give you the solution. You've got to praise God through the storm. Amen. And he'll see you through it. He'll see you through it. Every single time, he'll see you through it. With your heads bowed as we go to a time of invitation this morning. Encountering the storms. We'd like to have a nice landing when it's all said and done. We'd like to have the sea all calm when it's said and done. The truth of the matter is, many of us are dealing with damage from the storms we've gone through. Whether we deserve to be in the storm, whether we didn't deserve to be in the storm, we've got damage. We're dealing with hurt. We're dealing with 
things that we just can't get rid of eating at us. And that person shows up and it just brings back up the damage from the storm. And so here's the invitation today. Every one of us have been damaged by a storm. Might have been a person, might have been a family member. We might have even caused it. The way you get through that damage is to praise God that you are where you are right now. It's to give God praise through everything he has brought you through. And to give him praise going forward. Should we be warned? Yes. Should we listen to the warnings of God? Absolutely. Should we praise him when he gets us through the storm? Every single time. Do we come out different? Yes. Paul encounters a storm. The Lord blesses him through it, strengthens him through it, allows him to become a leader in the midst of being a prisoner through it all. And over 200 lives are saved. What does Paul do? He gets to praise God and say, Be a good cheer. Lord, I ask you right now that you would help us to be people of praise. Help us to praise you for who you are, for what you have done. You've brought us through many storms. The warning that you have heeded to us in your word to prevent some storms of life. And then, Lord, as we get through these storms, that we will praise you and give thanksgiving to you. I ask these things in Jesus' precious name.